What's going on, everyone? I'm streaming today, as seen. Um, if you're new to my streams, I usually take the first two minutes or so to make sure everything's set up properly. So I'm checking on my iPad to see if my levels are good. You might hear some doubling because I'll be playing it out loud. Checking on my iPad to see if my levels are good. You might hear some doubling because I'll be playing it out loud. Sounding good so far. I also adjusted my latency between me talking and when you guys receive it. So when I go on live chat, it's a little bit more instantaneous. I didn't know we could do that. Obviously, we can. Um, for those of you who are curious, I am <laughs> streaming to YouTube directly from my desktop using something called OBS Studio. I get that question a lot. This is what OBS Studio is. Basically, you set up a lot of inputs for all your different devices and sound devices, and you use them as you need them. It's pretty lit, but it also taxes your computer, so you need a decent computer to do multiple things at once. Like if I was just screen sharing, <clears throat> it'd be fine. But you start streaming video games or audio production, trash. Large reason why I got the computer that I just got. So that's that. That's that. That's that. Got some people in the chat. My people, Brad, what's good? What's good, Diallo? What's good, Christopher? What's good, Platinum Sound? What's good, Blake Williams? Um, I'm happy that you guys are here. Hopefully, I'm not taking no time from your day. You know, I ain't talking about nothing crazy. What's good, People Society? What's good, Blood Dragon? Mika says, you're busy right now, but I'll watch this later. Keep up the good work, MG, for real. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah, like, normally, I save them when I'm done now. And um, about maybe 30 minutes later, they'll end up on my channel. So just go back to youtube.com forward slash image the future and they'll shuffle the stupid thing about lives though they're not the first video when you go to my video list they're like they're in the top five or ten so you just got to remember the name of this and you'll find it and i normally share it on twitter too so if you ever like try to figure out which live i just did it'll be on my twitter what's good snow snow what's good one in black one what's good producer ko this will be available later what's good shane what's good tukavelli hey so let me get through a couple of minutes of these people jumping in real quick for you guys and then i'll go into the main discussion of this particular video if you're watching this as it's recorded just fast forward 10 minutes don't be difficult <laughs> i'm just checking on my devices because what i got to do uh is share it to twitter because it seems like everyone's on twitter and i saw your question in the chat i'm gonna answer it in a minute This real-time chat is crazy. Like, when you change the latency on me streaming, I can see you guys almost. You guys almost hear me, like, 10 seconds later versus the three minutes it seemed like before. I think I'm good now. All right. Thoughts on the new Mac Mini? Not for audio production. True production, hey, brother. Benny, what's good? I'm at work as well, but I'm good. Okay, you're tuned in, but you can multitask at work. Like I used to back in my government contractor days. What's good, Kazen? What's good, DJ Bullen? MG the Lo-Fi God. I'm trying to be bros. I'm not quite there yet. I need to release a serious project to really solidify that. Groovy Soul. What's good, bro? Max, ready to receive some wisdom. All right. Main, what's good? Shannar Ban, what's good? Hey, what's up, everybody? G Session Joe. I think this is the most people I've had in the chat this early in the game. But I'm almost ready to start. And what I'm going to try to do is like, <laughs> because this chat's real time, I'll be, I would be behind y'all now. There's mad people here, bro. I'm bugging. This is one watching now. Oh, this game, this, this iPad is trash. It's 50 watching. What's good, BK Banga? Appreciate you joining. What's good, brother? I want to say brother Britt. What's good? Grexaflex, what's good? DJ Georgie Porgy, what's good? Two of those guys are my moderators, hence the wrench icon. So if anyone gets kind of disrespectful or blatantly racist in the chat, they can clean it up. Um, That's kind of a sad thing to have to worry about now that I think about it as a content creator. But anyway, I want to start. Let me react to the comments from the live stream real quick. And then if you guys have feedback in regards to that, then I'll check them in the live chat. 
And then, Ryan, I just got your post on Twitter, but I'll answer that later. <clears throat> so yesterday, of course, you guys saw that I did the thing with CMP. We briefly discussed the lawsuit. And in the middle of that discussion, I was compelled to say, like, <laughs> be good or be good at it. And this kind of mantra was introduced to me by a, an original Harlem gangster. <laughs> and that's why I used the clip art that I used for this live stream. But anyway, he's taught me a whole lot. He took me to buy my first gun. Like, a lot of man-man stuff. You know, it was nothing bad, really. Because um, the misconception of street people or gangster people is that they're all criminals. And they're not. They just look and live life a different way. But um, he taught me so much. And I think the most profound thing that he taught me was be good or be good at it. And I can apply that to so many different things. When I brought that up in the discussion yesterday, it was interesting to see how well received that was for me to pass that on and for people to understand how to apply that to music, sampling and production. And I guess the, the smallest way to look at be good or be good at it is um, when we talk about the sampling debate is if you're gonna be good, don't sample or clear your samples. If you're going to be good at it, you start to get into the dark arts and manipulation and high risk behavior. And I have a feeling that the thing that resonated is that it seemed like the Juice World incident was a be good at it attempt, but I don't think it was. I honestly think that song was a fluke in terms of its success and impact. And what I mean is I don't think they planned it. And Nick Mirror described it on his Deconstructed. You know, he's been working with this kid for two years. He sends some beats, he sends them back songs, whatever. So they had a good idea. They sent it to SoundCloud. It blew up on SoundCloud. And at that point, you can't stop and slow down the momentum of your track or opportunities to get things cleared. And I'm getting a bad earring. Oh, God. <laughs> White noise in my ear. That was weird. It was like someone turned a tuner on in my left ear. But anyway, whoa. Uh, yeah, I think they were just going with the flow. And I don't think they probably didn't even know how to go about clearing that sample. But the thing that kind of puzzled me is I think they used the sample. And what I mean is not that we hear the interpolation. I think we actually hear the audio from Sting's record. And the thing about copyright and things like that, you can't interpolate records and you still have to clear them to some extent. But the percentage or the publishing entitlement to the artist, the label, and all that that circles around the master recording um, your splits look different if you're not using the master recording. When you're interpolating, you're then owing or need permission from the songwriters. So if they had no mechanisms to get in contact with either on any level, they, they're, they're SOL, but they still ran with their song. And also, I think they should have. What they did, I think, is the right way to do it. If Unless they intentionally avoided Sting, unless their lawyer or their entertainment manager. And where's the label on all of this, right? Unless they willfully neglect it to take care of business, I think this was the best thing they've done. So I'm not mad at them. But what I am mad at is the discussion changing to people on the internet saying, oh, well, I shouldn't sample, or I don't want to do that, or this is why I don't sample. Because that's kind of weird. Because what you're saying is you don't want to sample a record in fear that you're going to sell 5 million of them. Forget the consequences of the lawsuit for a minute, but just think about the stupendous reality of what really happened. This kid watched a movie, took the ending, melodined it, added a pad sound, sauced it up with some drums, and impacted five million people. I want to trade that for the world. No matter how indifferent I feel about their wave supply policies, I got to salute that brother for being able to make it both Juice World and Nick Mirror. <laughs> But them crying and disrespecting Sting is kind of kind of silly. It's kind of goofy. We ain't got time for that. Blake said, that's karma. <laughs> DJ Bullen said, I miss it, but you're here today, brother. Bro, can you teach us how to mingle samples so much that it's not recognizable, but still make it sound good? And that's what inspired this live session. So shout out to Tony underscore. I kind of answered him by saying, yo, I kind of, my whole channel is based on me, <laughs> me teaching people how to be good at it. That's why I don't double down on like a lot of music theory stuff. I don't double down on a lot of basics. I don't go through like the rigmarole of like A, B, C, and D type stuff. I start at Q and I try to take people through RSTUV because as you, as you level up creatively, you'll start to understand like some of the basic stuff. They have context and they have use, but if you understand some of the more broader concepts, everything under it comes with it. So for instance, like 
when I use scalar melodyne and things like that, I learn how to decipher and use music without having to learn how to play piano. So there's a lot of steps I try to help people skip just to create. I think that's important. So my video, this video, I'm gonna have some of that. Diallo, who's also in the chat, salute, says these kids have no understanding what it means to be a real musician. I think you may mean that in different ways. You may mean that in terms of Sting and uh, the hard work he put into making those particular songs and that those kids don't respect his craftsmanship, but also that can be read as uh, kids today have it easy. And I don't know. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that because we have computers and these tools that that automatically negates what what creativity really is, and that's just our ability to solve problems and think. I still think it takes me just as long to figure out a melodyne problem as it would for someone who can play by ear naturally to figure out a chord problem. I just think our platform has changed, and as a result, our rewards have also changed. And um, our opportunities have changed. And I, I fully embrace that difference. I fully embrace both sides. I'm just not the real musician either. So I can't resonate or push forward that message. I said, well, listen to like Thundercat and Terrace Martin and those guys. Those guys exist. But what you'll notice about real musicians in our demographic specifically, they're not prolific teachers. So it's I think it's just the way people are wired. It's a strange thing. Like people who are good at it don't want to show people. People who, who who are usually not the best at it and had to work really hard to get it want to share that experience so other people don't have to repeat it. And that's what I attempt to do, I think. Of course, we should sample. If you're going to move units, you have to be smart, though. Sampling sing for anything more than a second of his vocal stab is asking for it. When you're selling good, even, even when you're selling good, have your wallet ready. A little of this, a little of that. Um, you can't predict what you're gonna sell good, because this is this is not a this is not a uh, this is not serendipity. Nothing I make or sample is going to do what this did. <clears throat> no matter what, and I've sampled over a thousand records. None of them have made it to radio. So a person, sh a sample-based producer, shouldn't be expecting anything to do anything to be prepared for anything, because this situation isn't placed on Nick Mira. He's not responsible for the radio play. He's not responsible for the units moving. He just made the track. The people responsible is who's managing Juice World, who, who is publishing Juice World's music. The publisher or the person who gave permission to upload it and hit go. That person needs to watch out for those things. That's never been classically a producer issue. It started becoming a producer issue when I started the narrative that producers could self-release their music on streaming. So what I mean is, Sample-based producers who kind of been taken off of YouTube or taken off a of SoundClick or face demonetization or create all this art and can't monetize it. I wanted to push forward the narrative that you can do that with things like Track Library or TrackLive.com and um, royalty-free samples and Frank Dukes and all these other things that we expose you to. Um, you can still make that style of music with those style of samples and profit from them if you do it by being good, by getting stuff you can clear or paying for it to be cleared. Um, but that's the only time a producer really has to do that because you, the producer, is releasing it and monetizing it. Your streams are monetized. So you're going to make money quarterly if you opt into that kind of system. If you're just selling beats on BeatStars, none of those beats are cleared samples. You just got to keep track of the information. So when the artist does it, you're forthcoming with that information so that they know up front that they can inform their label people that, hey, this is a sample record. I like it a lot. I made the song for it. Can you guys make the calls to make sure that we get permission to do this properly? But even when you do that, doesn't mean the song's gonna be a hit either. And I think that's the people are contaminating those two ideas. I love it. I definitely feel the same way. This is hilarious. I added Nick and said, just like what we do, just like what they do with their MIDI as well, said be grateful to even be making money or even getting any type of percent. As well, be grateful that even where you're at in your current moment of music and streams, the level where the song has even been brought. So basically what Sky High is trying to say is, you may be upset about the 15%, but isn't that the same thing that you're trying to do a wave supply? Like, think about it. You, you want to be entitled to 50% of a two bar loop that can transform and be manipulated to be much more musically and time intensive, depending on the person's work ethic or creation process but you want a fixed rate. Well, Sting's a legend. 
these songs are classics like in his demographic so you can't expect him to move on his percentage when the percentages before you were zero what are we talking about and then outside of how much percentage you're getting why are you disrespecting this man that you sampled a he lets you get 15 percent and b look how much attention has gotten you look how many blessings you have think about the opportunities you can create from this momentum and he's absolutely right but i think there's a dark shadow matrix to that and what i mean by that is i think they are i think they they're uh they're fake mad i don't think nick mirror is really upset about this i think it's a publicity stunt um par partly i think it's part publicity stunt in a very odd way it's not it's not necessary in my opinion but for them it works right because you got me doing discussions you got busy works doing discussions you got the internet community of producers doing discussions about it so that brings some attention but then you have the producers in his comments, right? Like directly interacting with him and retweeting and um, spreading the message about what happened and bringing a bigger awareness to what's happening. And the only negative part that he's suffering is from people like me who are pointing out the uh, hypocrisy of the wave supply situation. I'm sure that's not a calculated risk that they were trying to take because I've seen people in the comments saying, are these free loops that you gave away today um, interpolated? And they try to make a joke about it, but that was a good question, even if he spelled it wrong. Are these interpreted, interpolated MIDIs that you're giving us for free? Do we have to worry about clearing them with you or a real label because of the situation you're in? What are we talking about? So they have to be very careful with this game that they're playing because, you know, a lot of people subscribe to that. Even negative attention is good attention. Stay woke. I'll chalk this one up to karma. Sampling is cool, but you got to learn the biz and understand what you're signing up for. But jumping on Twitter and giving Sting the finger ain't too smart. Pretty much. This type of discussion I come for, dropping some truth. It's all about the vibes. They steal it because they can't feel it. Ooh, that's saucy. That's saucy. That's saucy, MK Ultraman. I, 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 I agree and disagree. I agree that I sample for vibes that I don't naturally think of or that I cannot easily duplicate. And I think the whole purpose we make music is to change the vibes of the people that listen to it, right? That song has a good vibe. That song makes me feel good, or that song makes me sad, or that song's, you know, fitting for my mood. So I don't think that's the slight. I think the slight is the stealing part of it. You steal it. I don't know. I don't look at sampling as stealing as much. Because you could be literal and technical and be like, well, if it's not yours, it's not yours. And then we get into that whole parody about drum sounds. And people love to stay away from that because they haven't justified it in their head yet. But if you're not raising a goat farm, killing the goat, skinning the goat, making the drum, making the microphone, making the sound capture device, Processing this stuff with your own plugins, with your own doll, with your own code, with your own ones and zeros, then in a very figurative way, even if you didn't sample records, you're always sampling something. The drum shots are samples in a very literal sense. So everyone is sampling. Anyone doing music on a computer is sampling something. Even if you're playing Omnisphere, those are sampled instruments. Nexus, sampled. So the line we're talking about, because people made those samples, no no different, no less, made the instrument that was sampled, no different than, than no less, and if not more challenging than the person writing four chords with the piano. So we're, 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 we're cross-contaminating two different concepts. So the, the main concept is if you take someone else's music to make new music, um, it's stealing, and it's not. It's collage, it's artwork, it's synthetic creation, and I argue that that's the only thing that humans can and have done. And that's largely to my Alex Jones alien side of my brain that goes in. No human created the system that we're part of right now. And no baby survived in the forest in the Stone Age and raised itself. So there had to be something a little bit more advanced, if not more intelligent than we are amongst us or previously amongst us. But that's not what this discussion is about. So I don't think sampling is not stealing. Sampling a record, publishing the record, not giving credit for that record, and making a killing of attention and money off of that record without acknowledging or properly compensating the original artists involved or writers involved, that is stealing. The business part is stealing. The art part, I don't think, is stealing. 
unless you're a pathological liar and pretend like you can do everything very good by yourself and you've done the most for the community and the whole time you have been stealing and reselling things and not being forthcoming with your inspiration. But that's still different than sampling music. No subs there. <laughs> Folks need to get their business right. Clear samples or get got. I agree, but that is not up to us in the context of how this scenario played out. Remember, this kid is signed to a label, guys. This isn't like me and you messing around on SoundCloud and Spotify. This, The business sense of this, don't matter what Nick Mira or that team learned, they weren't, they weren't responsible for this. They weren't directly responsible for the release and the blow up shulation of the song. Wow, a snare hit hit a copyright violation? How is that possible? I really think that you have to differentiate yourself. I don't think that has changed in the music industry. Things that look and sound good are still what works in the digital world. That is my two cents. I think that originality has been a little lost. People are so wrapped in trying to do what the Joneses are doing and not just making music anymore. When I turn on the radio, it's rare that all I hear is the same music twisted in a different way. When I do hear something different, it definitely catches my attention. Come on guys, Adele, that chick may have some bad moments, but I really don't think they shared her out. So he brought up a lot of good points, a lot of different things I want to respond to. The first one is, the snare violation wasn't a copyright violation. It was a uh, universal music group cease and desist type thing. Meaning the, the algorithm database that UMG uses for YouTube and SoundCloud scans all of our music all day long. And it automatically hits, hits a nerve and then it automatically gets removed. In the case of my song that I was referring to that I always bring up that really pissed me off, which is why I really don't love SoundCloud or use it to its full potential, why I never got a pro SoundCloud, why I didn't stay on that road, is because I posted up an original track um, that was a trap beat, and everything was just its own thing. It was such a strange sounding track, too. It wasn't my best work or anything. It was just a, a weird thing that I liked, and I put it up and shared it with people. Then I got that uh, notification from SoundCloud, and I tried to reply to it. I said, what the hell is this algorithm talking about? What the hell is the human talking about? Can we get a human to look at this? And um, SoundCloud pretty much just didn't, I don't even think a human responded to me. It was like these default canned responses of shut the hell up, we're removing this because we don't want beef with the major label. And that's what happened. But in that claim, it's the song that they compared my song to. And it was like this South American, Spanish, it's like such a random song on their catalog. It was nothing that I would ever heard in my life let alone anything in my music that would have been that, except for the snares were similar, the polo snare. Very strange, very strange occurrence. Um, and it doesn't happen because I've used the polo snare in other uploads and that didn't happen. So maybe it was the tonality, maybe it's like sounding them, right? Maybe they're looking at the timbre of our songs and enough of it was similar to strike the engine because the engine is stupid. So you need a human to really listen, but they don't put humans in it. They just bully you. That's a whole different issue. So that's that. Um, and then he said, uh, people are wrapped up into what the Joneses are doing and not making music, not just making music anymore. That's a strange assertion because it's always been this way. And I don't remember a time in life where it hasn't been this way. The only thing that changed between yesterday and today in a metaphorical sense is that social media has connected more of us simultaneously. It wasn't that like without social media or the internet, life was different. It was just like you knew less people. So you're less inspired, less motivated, less manipulated, less influenced. You're less a whole lot of things because there weren't that many choices for the individual to connect to different tribes and groups of people. So in social media, what you see through your social media is who you connect with. And what you're noticing is the people that you connect with are most like you. And even if they're not exactly like you, they're similar to you. So you have a lot of friends out there who are more like each other and they all worry about, think about, share and act like the same things. That's how humans are subdivided. That's the quadrants we follow in. So if you join social media and you find my channel, you might rock with me, but then there's other people who don't rock with me, rock with another channel. It's not that I'm not there anymore. It's just that they're attracted to that channel or that personality and they have a different set of rules and things that they notice. Whereas with music production and hip hop and trap, we notice a lot of trap sounds the same. That's because we're exposed to all the people who make trap. So it's always going to sound the same to us because we consume way more trap than everyone else who doesn't make trap or who doesn't have friends posting trap all day. 
even when you're on Instagram and you know that little uh, five seconds when the song starts to play, even if you go past it, you heard it. Your brain did the, the math to finish that phrase. So you listen to hundreds of beats if you're an Instagram producer following producers a day. It can't sound different unless someone does something totally different. But who in your friends list is doing things totally different if you guys are all joined together with common denominators? So if you want to break your exposure to the same shit, you got to listen to other shit and follow different kinds of people and expand your influence. And even like on title, I'll show you this if I can. Title is the one I have a subscription service to. I might get Spotify too. Spotify does a better job with playlists at the moment, but Tidal always has the new shit that comes out. And Tidal is the only one that does exclusive stuff that I miss versus the others. So, Tidal has suggested new albums, right? And that's a pretty big list. I think each row has six, and it'll go down for a while. So, let's just pretend it's 30. Let's pretend 30 new albums came out in the last week or two. So 30 times 10, 300 new songs came out on a managed label investment level releases. Um, and my timeline only talked about three of them. So when I open up title, which ones do you think I'm gonna go to first? The three that I saw on my timeline all week. The playlist curator kept sharing it. The people making comments on Travis Scott's tour. The Metro Boomin people. That's all I see. So when I go to title, those are the first three that I check out. But maybe I get adventurous and check out one or two more on my own. Maybe I check out someone I've never heard before. Even still, I only listen to six. There's still 24 albums that came out that I'll never listen to. So I, I, I paint that example to say that there is a lot of different kind of music out there. You're just not tuned to find it. Stay woke. Anyway, <laughs> when I hear something different, it catches my attention. Okay. Come on, guys. Adele, really? That chick may have some bad moments, but I really don't think I have to share her out. Well, I didn't say share. Share was the early version of autotune. I said Melodyne. Melodyne is the antithesis of autotune. Melodyne sounds natural. In fact, it's hard to T pain Melodyne that I got autotune for the T pain effect, not for the Melodyne effect. So. There's a lot of singers I don't want to say no names because I know some of the industry heads still watch me. And I don't need those DMs and those group texts to go out. Like, who does he think he is? But I know for facts. Even my uncle, who's a mix engineer, for facts, he was looking for people who knew how to engineer with Melodyne. And I knew the artists he was working with. Everyone gets Melodyne. And I only said that off the cusp because that tool was created for that effect. It was created for perfect vocal performances or creative vocal performances. That's not a bad thing, but these humans, Adele, Whitney Houston, whoever, don't always have a perfect vocal performance. So if a studio or record label is paying someone X amount of dollars per hour to get a perfect song with perfect takes and all these things that go into a major artist release, why the hell would they rebook studio time when they can just get an engineer to melodyne it? Like, you know what I mean? What if the, what if the track changes and they have to use a different piano part and it changes the key inherently? You think they're going to get her to sing it all over again in a different vibrato that she doesn't sing in? No, they're going to melodyne it. That's what it's for. I don't I don't understand what the... That wasn't disrespect. That is what is happening. That is based on a true story. That's what melodyne is for. Why do you think it's $800? Vocaline and melodyne. The timing that you hear in Amigos ad-libs and stuff, you think they punch in like that? You see these kids record. They'll be sitting there in the studio and they got the poor white guy over there. Like, here's my bars. Play that back real quick. Don't know how annoying that is. Yeah. All right. Punch me right there. Nah, man. Go back. Re Fuck all of that. You need Melodyne and Vocal Line to fix that. Or Studio One. So what are we talking about? And that's for our big rappers. So you think singers are different? Singers are much more difficult to record and track. So it may, it's they have to have it. Trust me. That's not even an argument. That's from the horse's mouth. That's from the people who solicited Old heads who are mix engineers need people who understand Melodyne because of the, the budgets changed with the industry. So they have to use Melodyne to compensate for the fact they're not going to get paid to retrack it. Stay woke. <laughs> that's my forte. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. All right. 
Fake thug, no love, you get the slug. Nas did it best. They're saying Nas used the sample back in the day. He did. MG, I have some of the same views as you. But when I share them, I'm negative. I have gone through stages since 2005, so I do know what's going on. I've been woke since MySpace. Shot, salute King Davis. For real. We remember. Z. I remember you had said in the vid... Whatever you just said in this video is actual facts. People are fools. <laughs> As a producer, I question the people around me. You are very true on making your way to others. But my true feelings say I cannot give them because they're hot whack. I think he's not English. I think he's translating this. I think what he was trying to say is um, he was just re he was commenting on how I can convey truth or how I can convey my opinion in such a strong way and um, how it's different than what the mainstream opinions usually are. He says he keeps this to himself because he either A, he doesn't value the people around him, he thinks they're stupid, or B, when he says it, similar to what King Davis is saying, that people think the idea or concept is whack um, for whatever reason, whether these are delivery issues or whatever. Um, I think the only, the only reason why people may be copacetic or resonate with what I'm saying in this video is because there's people like King Davis um, who, who remember what I remember and experience what I experience. But that goes back to the new music, everything sounds the same discussion. I'm going to attract people to me who are mostly like me and then get fringe followers who are further out of the circle of harmony. Um, but as long as the core resonates with me, it'll always sound like I'm telling the truth because my truth is niche to my group. I'm not speaking the truth about life on Mars. I'm not talking about the truth on STEM research. I'm not talking about the truth in some kind of mathematic equation. I'm talking about what I'm consumed with. And when you're consumed with it, like I'm consumed with it, it's all the same. Like the only way for it not to be true, for it not for it to be facts, is if I'm intentionally trying to lie or manipulate something. And I have no reason to do do it with this. The, the, this thing is entertaining by itself. This feeds itself. <laughs> I'm enjoying these streams. Keep them up. Hey, here I am. Ronnie said he charged it all to the game. He brought up some of the old stuff that happened with Napster. And how the music industry failed to react to that properly. And since they got the sophistication of new platforms to start divvying out profits, things are about to get very interesting. And I'm interpolating his response. <laughs> but uh, I said this to myself. You know, what was funny about this live stream is that I recorded it already. But it was totally different. The tone of it and everything was totally different. But <laughs> when I played it back, the audio was muted. Because that program's trash. And I'd much rather go live anyway. But in it, it ties into this. The reason why you don't have to worry about not sampling ever is that our systems are getting very sophisticated. In my channel, I've covered most of these systems, the baby systems, like the light versions of what's really available. So Sononym is a great idea for people who curate their own li library. And those libraries are usually small, 50,000 files or less, 100,000 on a good day. But Sononym can only do so much and it only provides benefit to people like us. But iTunes, Amazon, Spotify even, they deal with that many files a day. So they have systems way more sophisticated, faster and more reliable than even that. So to make it flip a switch and give it some extra code or algorithm to detect and compare tracks is, is a flick of the wrist. And what I had discovered in talking to myself in that video was that the reason why they haven't done it yet is that in order to train an algorithm or AI to compare all of our music to see who's stealing what from who and what's what and what's a duplicate and all that is that they're gonna have to pay us because the grounds for them Sony or UMG to go after me for using a polo snare, they would have to justify the grounds for how they figured that out. Meaning in order for me to upload a hundred, let's say if I'm high volume and I did a hundred beat upload on a weekend and you want to compare all my tracks to all the other tracks, I'm, I'm feeding your AI. I'm working for you in, in, a, in a very bizarre kind of way that people don't think about. It's a consequence people don't think about. The AI is human drained. So if you have all these humans uploading music and you're across and you, you take the permission from us to compare our music to someone else's 
first of all, not from the attack, but from the defense. You, you violate my privacy, so to speak, although you kind of signed it away in the EULA. But I think on a constitutional level or on a macro level that hasn't been discussed yet, they don't do it because there's going to be a lot of people bitching, moaning, and complaining that these companies profit off of comparing our music and our human intelligence to prime time it for the big labels who are going to then profit off of every little sound or soundbite. And I think they don't know the answer to the reverse of that problem yet. And that's why that AI isn't used in that capacity. But I've spoken to a per, two, two people, one from Switzerland and one lady that's in Seoul, Korea. Is it Seoul, Korea or is it Singapore? The one I talked to in Singapore, she developed the AI that detects hit songs. That's its only function. And I mentioned this back, back a few months ago, but she's not shopping it to me. She just wanted to talk to me because she saw my discussions on similar programs. She's selling it to Spotify or iTunes or licensing it. That's what she's interested in because they're going to be able to take these 90,000 uploads a day, sort out the cream to the top, then get a human. Instead of getting a human to listen to 90,000 for a playlist, they'll get the human to listen to 90 for a playlist. And then it just makes the quality and the, the end user experience way more smoother just with that slight change in algorithm. What's a good song? What's a hit song? And comparing enough music to know what people gravitate towards, very similar to how me and you have this conversation. You'll see the ad on Twitter. You'll see the ad on YouTube. you see the ad on Facebook. Our playlists and our music experience will be curated the same way. Now, take that even further. If you have a system that detects it as an afterthought, you can just reverse that algorithm and create it your damn self. If I was Spotify and I had that algorithm and I had 900,000 songs a month or a week or whatever the hell it is, I just sign an artist, take the lowest common denominators and try to throw mine out there. I have access to the playlist. I have access to the people, the CRM data. You can blow up your own artists. And that's if they're not already doing that. Because I want you guys to keep in mind that Boosted Dreams and all that went to streaming and no one has streaming flagged it. But if I sampled it, I'm sure DistroKid would have banned my account already. I ain't even talking about radio yet. I'm just talking about the platform that you use to upload. So I need y'all to stay a little bit woker than woke out there. So I know, I know we're in a different place. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to Paul Revere this shit. <laughs> the British are coming. No, they're not coming. They're already here, fellas. I just listened to the song and I remember it. The real conspiracy is how the ball is intentionally dropped not to clear the sample. Exactly. Because that does not exist on that level. That was an experiment. <laughs> so if the dude had interpolated the MIDI after reworking it or newtoning it or melodining it, that would be fine. But the ideal is that the copyright holders, usually not the artists, are pushing their rights further and further and further until the previously uncopyrighted groove can now be sued over, which is the Marvin Gaye Robin Thicke issue. Whack due to the guy's hypocrisy, wave supply. But music is all reference. No one makes it all up. Exactly. Where, where do we draw the line in the sand in this new world? Especially with a person out me going there talking about be good at it. And I'm showing you how to Serato, Melodyne, Sononym, everything. What are they going to do with me? And I don't mean me personally. I mean with the people that I know I'm influencing <laughs> that are doing this on a very profound level. What do you do with them? I'm not getting paid to figure that out. I always heard that the label owns and piece to president loves to sue for people who use those drums. Nothing is surprising when it comes to money. Exactly. And that's it. The only reason why this is a big deal is because of the 5 million units equivalent of streaming. If it was 5,000 triple wood on SoundCloud, Sting would not care because Sting does not profit from it underperforming. Sting could only profit from it overperforming. That's when people hear it, have a greater chance of being exposed to it, and then act. No one's going to send Sting a DM about some guy on Instagram who sampled his record with Machine, struggling on eight chops. Like, let's cut it out. And that's only towards the people who be like, I'm not sampling. No, cut it out. Don't do that. <laughs> Who's responsible, Juice World or the label? The label, the person who owns the rights to the song in terms of publishing the song or releasing the song. The person that cuts Juice World his check is the one responsible. He's talking to CMP. Now he's used it on the album. Juice did this on purpose marketing trick maybe if you sample someone else's music you should not get publishing Diallo you're here in the chat I don't know about that bro I don't know 
because that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. I'll tell you why that doesn't make sense. What I mean by that doesn't make sense. So use the word sample. Do you mean like they did? They cut the record and then they add it to it? Do you mean interpolate it? Someone who's profound could just replay it or someone like me who can hack it? Do you mean someone who heard it in passing and they replayed it live? They heard the guitar, but they played it on piano and they don't know why they played that on piano. What do you mean by sample? Because if you say if someone takes the master recording like they did and use it, you shouldn't be entitled to anything because most of the juice is there, which is true. But to say they shouldn't get anything would mean that anyone could have taken that clip and sold five million copies. And that's bullshit. So if you're taking or re-release it, let's let's do it, make it simple. Let's say we took Sting's song and I re-released it, right? Like now that's what I call Music 99 or whatever. If I took Sting's song and I re-released it and did nothing to it, I sampled it or I just re-released it under my own label and I made Sting $5 million more million, I'm not entitled to anything. Because if anyone could do it, someone else would have made Sting $5 more million. In fact, Sting himself would have made him $5 million more million. So it's not it's not a genuine it's not a genuine sentiment to suggest that there is something that happened with Sting the song. There is a collaboration that took place. There is an added amount of value or energy that takes place. So that's why I disagree. You should not get publishing. Someone should get something. Maybe we should call it something different because of the digital age. But at that point of that synthetic creation, Juice World's fans and Nick Mira fans largely push that ball down the hill. And they are entitled at least to their effort in the five million sold. So I don't know what that looks like. Again, I'm not a copyright lawyer. I'm not qualified to make that decision. But to say they're entitled to nothing is a bit ridiculous because of the opposite end of what that means. It's not out there doing five million by itself. The only argument that that justifies is like, then don't sample or don't or don't touch people's other music. And which which really ridiculous about that sentiment is that after, what, 50 to 70 years, anyone can take your shit anyway? Meaning when you die, the people in the future could take it anyway? So it, it, even that is a, is a temporal marker. Even then, it's just like this, this thing that we gained agreement on. It's not a real thing. No one's really protecting you. That's just as far as the law will allow you to claim money from it. That's not real protection. That's not a real copyright. That's not real intellectual property. The moment you die, you release it to the universe. Stay woke. So... We're not having a philosophical debate. We don't got to go that deep, but in a more realistic sense. Come on now. They're going with these AIs that I was talking about earlier. And this is the bigger point that I wanted to make in that video. <laughs> because the AIs can, are going to compare songs without our permission, because they're going to use the human training, because they're going to do all this shit, then it's going to be easier for them to re-monetize things. And what I mean is if they go to all these lo-fi producers who are sampling and they shazam the shit out of that, what they're going to do instead of removing them is that they're going to attach a percentage or rate similar to track live ABC within the streaming service itself and automatically allocate the dividends to who they sampled as a consequence. I think, I think it's just going to like, they're going to change the EULA. You're going to hit accept, accept, accept. And then when you look at your split sheet, you're going to see like five new writers and you're going to have to deal with it because you uploaded it. But I don't think they're going to go after people and shut them down because the, the beauty of what we're doing, the beauty of risking it, the beauty of be good at it, is that if it wasn't Sting, let's say it was some guy, some some homeless man right now, a jazz musician who's homeless. He's 70 something years old and, you know, his family died or something. Right. And he's out in the streets. People know him. He still tries to gig or he performs outside or something. But what if like the lo-fi crowd are always using his records and they're getting these big streams on these lo-fi playlists? And they're accruing 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars monthly. And then they properly allocate that. And then someone properly notifies or contacts him, his representation, his former label. And then instead of them pulling that down and removing it, they now share that with that musician. And now he has a different quality of life. He has a different shine now. He gets to tell a story. He'll get interviewed. You know how that should go. Someone asks to collaborate with him, or these producers will be able to contact him because they could locate him now. And they'll know the story and preserve that in history, preserve that in the databases. There's, there's a whole bunch of positive shit that comes from sampling. That's why I don't get why people are so close-minded about it, because they're thinking about business ass backwards. This shit's over, guys. Like, 
As soon as Spice came out, it was dead. Like, I, I really want to go in on that one day, but these are signs. These are the, the, these are symptoms, not root causes. This is this train is leaving regardless if we react to it or not. This is what the future is going to be. What I'm trying to do is get people to understand it and accept it. <laughs> accept it without procrastinating and feeling defeated. That's a better way of phrasing that. So it's going to help a lot of people once they work out the kinks and the legal, once they pass the right legislation. I think that last legislation they passed for us is the gateway to that because they're setting the rates. And once you have the rates fixed and in law and legalese and people can understand it and it's simplified, then all you got to do is copy and paste that to the, the set of rules by the AI let it wreak its havoc. Let old girl from Singapore sell her algorithm. Let Sononym and Atlas figure out the drums. Like, guys, it's what the fuck you think is happening? You think people want you to want to help you make better struggle beats? <laughs> that's not the end goal. And I don't mean that humans are doing that intentionally. I'm saying that's the byproduct of it. That's what the that's what the top of the pyramid always does. It's just always that way. It's like you cannot beat it. So we hope we can sample. We hope they can figure that out. And we hope that that creative license is properly managed. And then everyone gets to eat for those freak accidents that reach 5 million. Nokami says, I talked to an attorney a while back about sampling. He did confirm that there are some publishers that hire people just to listen to releases on hip hop and then cross-reference them to their own catalog. There are even companies that buy, buy old catalog intentionally to go after these hip hop records. Well, they own some narc shit. But I mean, that's what people do for money, like bro said earlier. Think, in a few years, Spotify will have built a scanner to pick up all the time of upload, just like YouTube content ID. Not even a few years, they already have it. I guess that we're, we're all sensing the same thing, but they already have it. They just don't have the legal groundworks to implement the financial hierarchy they're going to need. Because then for the people who died or the people they can't locate or the aliases, they're going to need a certain fund. So this is what's going to happen. Like, we'll use Spotify as an example. They're going to have to split those funds up automatically from the lo-fi producers or whoever. They had to put it into an account and you know they're going to put interest on that account, right? They're going to get that special account where Spotify makes extra money on top of the money that they're holding. So they're going to need the legality to justify the extra money it's earning while it's unclaimed. And then they're going to have to keep that original amount in an unclaimed account. So in a fixed amount of time that has to be decided by law that if an artist or their grandchild comes to claim it, they can. And it's there, just like unclaimed money at your local state treasury. So they're going to do the same thing with the digital content IDs. And the, but what I'm saying is the AI is already there. It's it's not they're not looking that they're not trying to develop that. They're trying to develop the capitalism arm of it. <laughs> they deserve that lawsuit, dude. This doesn't even sound like it's interpolated. It sounds like a straight sample with some extra reverb. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think Nick Mira sampled it and added stuff to it. And I think that's why it's 15 percent and not 50 percent. With Sting's track record, we're surprised as any percent. But I think he left the sample in there on top of that. On bro. <laughs> CMP has a problem letting other people talk. I talk too much. CMP talks too much. There's no way to negotiate that unless we get a mediator. And then we become everyday struggle. <laughs> Studio One Gang. Hey, this was dope. 100. Put Mr. Different on this talk. You know what's funny about life? He said put Mr. Different on this talk. And then Mr. Different... And the other guys did the same talk. It's hilarious. That's hilarious. That's foreshadowed. It's a creative device. I always stray away from sampling. Sure, maybe I'll use a sample for inspiration, but never my final mix. Music should be my own creation. I and I agree and disagree. Because think about think about what just happened. I'll start with the sample. I'll add to it. Inspiration. But then the end is my own creation. That, 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 you can't have it both ways, right? Just because what, what Beanie Siegel said, he said, even if you mute it, the curse is still there, right? What would he have said? <laughs> that was profound, by the way. One of the best lyricists. But that, that's the same thing with a sample. Even if you mute the sample, the effect and influence of the humans and inspiration of the humans is still there in your derivative work. The, 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 the loophole that we're in is a technical loophole. Well, can you charge people for inspiration if they can figure it out they will but they're not it's too people people go to war for that shit because everyone's biting me the way i see it right you know what i mean so i would i would be going after everyone it'll drive you crazy so no they can't do that but the sentiment doesn't it doesn't check out i don't think i don't think i don't think the sentiment 
checks out. If I start with the with the inspiration thing and I ended up building around that and replacing it and going a different direction, the 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 root of that harmony and that structure in that mode is still there. You still sampled. We're we're just trying to wiggle out the definition of sampling, and and that's the funny part. There is no clear definition of sampling, like a as proven with that Marvin Gaye Pharrell lawsuit. What the hell did they sue over? Pharrell plays drums, Pharrell plays keyboards. They didn't use the chords. They, they try to justify the walk down. Oh, oh a turnaround. Doom, 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 doom. Really, my dude? Not even the same one, just a similar one. Just musically and harmonically, a Marvin Gaye signature walk down. That Marvin Gaye can't use no more. So it's not a competition clause. It's, there's nothing that takes away from Marvin Gaye by them borrowing that walk down. But they borrow, but what was per, per, perplexing about it, they borrow the, the percussion section, right? They reanimated that, but they couldn't sue for that because drums, you know, is less, is less creative and less human if it's a drum set or if it's a drummer. But the walk down, the fucking walk down. So people, people are stretching it. You got to convince some old guy who doesn't listen to hip hop. What's what? That's all. And who has the advantage in that situation? So it's not even real. This is this whole thing's a matrix of capitalism and bullshit. Humans are not original. Why do you think you're original? And, and once you divorce, once you divorce your attachment to that idea, you become more creative because you become more inspired because you allow yourself to reach into more bags. Stay woke. I'm trying. I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to do with my channel. I'm trying to get y'all to see the light, man. I can only take you to the water. I can't make y'all drink it. So that's my Q&A about that. <laughs> that was bullshit there, my G. Give me an example of how. They go to your state for a limited time. The copyright law doesn't protect you for eternity. Like a Chopin, Canon and D. They're not protecting Patchabell at this current moment. Every pop song that hits on radio is Patchabell, Canon and D. Nothing's going to his estate. I'm, I'm talking long term. I'm not talking about the next couple of years. I miss a lot of comments here, guys. A lot of people here. I appreciate y'all listening to me rant. Too much free knowledge. Hey. I'm looking at, I'm just trying to get the tone of the questions. <laughs> yeah, so we're back on goat farms again. You don't need a goat farm if you want to play that originality card. The melodyne effect is called transparent. Facts. Drake without pitch correction. Uh oh. They don't only just pitch correct Drake, they stack his voice with several different voices. It's very interesting. Yeah, he has to be careful if he's doing this publicly. If he's stunting publicly, Singh's lawyers can just say, pull the whole thing. Because we can. The sampling debate is about money and um, jealousy. Or, or you can, or to make that better, it's about money and greed. It's not really jealousy. It's, it's the, you have the audacity to monetize my recording on my work and then that human in that moment and that ego and that pride goes well I created this work but they don't acknowledge the people that inspired them they, they don't acknowledge the muted Ray Charles or the BB King in that guitar as well so it, it, it's messy but because they pretend they can't analyze our minds they can't do it they can't they can't stand on that it's like people just stand on what they're allowed to stand on 
That's why I say this shit's a matrix. People would just be making stuff up. That's why I don't get into the... I don't think it's an argument. It just is what it is. All of this talk is just an attempt to beat down creatives, trying to make us scared of being great. A, think about... To get 5 million streams or whatever the number was, was a good problem to have. Exacto mundo. How are you finding Waveform 9 for sample manipulation? I don't use Waveform 9 for sample manipulation. I use it for creating... <laughs> I use it for creating my own wave supply of loops. Do you have any good videos about the sniffness of S1 creatively and how to get around that? I don't think S1 is creatively stiff. You're going to have to help me understand what you mean. It's, it's one of the fastest dolls I've used. L Boogie. Nothing wrong with the other side, just a bigger lawyer. Hey, what is it about that S1 that makes it feel draining? Barrel eye. I have no idea what you're talking about, brother. <laughs> you're going through some internal adjustments of switching your workflow. That That's not S1 thing. That's anytime you switch a DAW. Anytime you switch a DAW, you're going to be drained because you're going to want to use muscle memory to solve a problem. And you're going to have to find the solution to a problem that was easy to solve in the previous program. And that's only because you don't know the new program. Once you get to know the new program and how it solves the same problems, you don't feel that way no more. So if you if if you're trying to figure out why you feel that way, you're not actually solving problems. So you have to change your mind to go one thing at a time, and that and that's how I learned all the dolls. I didn't. I never learned all the dolls all the way. I learned all the dolls that I was interested in to solve a problem. So when Ableton came out, the only thing I focused on was how do I get audio in here? How do I loop four bars of audio? You know, trim, cut, truncate. And how do I move warp markers around? And how do I fix time signatures, right? This is very super specific. You bring something into the timeline, you zone it in, bounce it in place or whatever you do. And then you just mess around with these little lines within a fixed amount of time. And then you, you enjoy the results. And then once you get your mind wrapped around that, you go, all right, well, I know how to put samples in here and fix samples. Let me get my favorite sample I could never sample before, put it in here. Ah, all right, now I have the pocket where I can put my drums. How do I put drums? You put your drums in there. Boom. All right. I got my drums. I got my sample. I'm missing a baseline. What does this program offer for bass? Cool. Oh, trash. Let me go to my baseline VST. All right. Dope. You see what I'm saying? You do it like that. You don't do it like, like, I don't know what these symbols mean. Like, uh, like the, the notation. I don't know what those mean. I don't have them in muscle memory. I just sit there and put my mouse there until it tells me. One sixteenths. I solved the problem. All right. Well, how do I go from one sixteenths to one thirty two? I hope I go up. There it is. That's 132s. Like, I don't sit there and be like, help and go through the whole thing. In most cases, some cases I do. Um, Ableton Live was one of the first times I read a whole manual or sped read it. I just, I just, when nine came out, I read everything because I knew it added a lot since I last used it. And I just got familiar, but it doesn't mean I know how to use it or how to do it. I just had certain things that jumped out into my consciousness that I wanted to investigate further. So it just depends, bro. It's not, it's not stiff, though. But I'll, maybe I'll show you. <laughs> Bigwig is just to some developers. They used to program in Ableton and made their own doll features to guys at Ableton Able Look. Hey, word share. The solution for everybody is to go full into sampling. They can't sue us all. <laughs> uh, the United States has how many lawsuits out there in Washington, D.C.? Don't be, don't, be don't be too confident. They got the military tribunals cooking up. They, they approved... Our local courts on a state level to be able to host military tribunals. And I don't know if anyone's following that because you know everyone's distracted by Nick Mira. But uh it, never mind. That's that's not even that's not even the platform for that. There are only twelve notes in music. Twelve. Exactly. You're gonna have some cross contamination, even if you don't mean to. Nick is lucky he didn't get Godzilla. Facts. They don't complain about classical samples because the computers are usually dead. And the songs are stupid old. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Your intellectual property is is as old as the people around you. Remember, mind you, like uh, think about all the people that died the year you were born. Like, there's a lot of humans. Like, there's a lot of people with ideas. There's a lot, there's a lot of things that happen. Like, when you're the oldest person on this planet, maybe I'll say it that way. When you're the oldest person left on this planet, and that day will come for some of us where you're the oldest person on the planet. That means everyone older than you is dead. That means this whole planet died because you're the oldest, per you're among the oldest people on this planet. 
at a particular time, right? When you get into your 90s, right? Anyone 90 and up is dead, you and your contemporaries are the only ones alive. That means the whole globe, all 7 billion people here right now are dead. You think they're, you think those people in the future can give a fuck about y'all 7 billion cords? Get out of here. Like, it's not even a real problem. It's just opportune in the moment with the systems that we've gained agreement on. That's what civilization is. It's the games we decide to play with each other. It's not really based in reality. I hate when people try to use logic for things that humans made up because we're not logical. Anyway, even fully trained musicians take inspiration from others. Yes, that's how you learn anything, bro. Like, yeah, the police is just dub. Like, come on now, we know what it is. MG, would you say that plagiarism music today is at an all time high? I think they've always plagiarized music. I don't, I don't recall a time when music wasn't plagiarized. I haven't heard a original song. I've heard original sounds, but I haven't heard original song. I mean, when you format genres, it, you take away the originality aspect. That's why I don't understand what people are confused about. When hip hop became 16 bars, eight bars, they took away all the different, uh, the variants that could have been born instead of that. They, they, the labels only signed and released and printed and played would fit the club format or the radio format, right? Like you remember back in the day, they used to have different formats. You know, they had the 12 minute long maxi or whatever. When's the last time you've seen someone do that? That's because humans always want things to be efficient. Our, our nature to be lazy, we, we mistaken it as laziness. It's not laziness, it's efficiency. Our nature to become efficient narrows down the realm of possibilities, meaning you want to narrow down your possibilities to something that's good and effective and works in the moment. And I keep using the word moment because in 10 years, that looks like something else. So you narrow it down and then people copy that because someone or a group of people figured out what that format looks like. And then people get bent out of shape going, well, I'm making triangles over here and no one wants to play with my triangle because they built the perfect square. Because if we take your triangle instead, everyone's going to copy you and make the perfect triangle and then the square guy's going to be upset. Everyone, someone has to lose, guys. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, like the people who pride themselves on originality, the moment you get your wish, you're not original no more because you're going to find five other people who swear up and down that they did that first too. And because you don't know everybody, you don't know how not unique you are. Like, <laughs> I don't know. We're like, we're like snowflakes, bro. I, I can't even explain it. I can't, I don't have human words to describe what I'm trying to say. Which easy keys do you, instruments do you recommend? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which easy key instrument you get. You want the ability to manipulate. And all of them have that ability. Oh, S1 is a shit right now. Yeah, S1 is taking over because of the urban pull that it has. People take their own samples just need to realize most of the music will be buried in time. Yes. You need to get back to that Ableton. I don't know what for. That's interesting. That's an interesting suggestion. Talk about what the other dolls do that Ableton don't. You're looking at it. Ableton doesn't do Studio One stuff at all. Like this chord track up here, this right click bounce to Melodyne, some of this stuff. It does do, uh, this is quantized audio. It quantizes audio. It has a better groove pull because you can hear it in real time. But other than that, from a MIDI perspective, you know, locking the scale, like just look at the piano roll, not even comparing it, just look at it. It doesn't have none of that. So Ableton will apply to people who don't care about that. I always say that the people who write the codes to these DAWs and the reason why they always late to the party is they're not people like us. We're not making DAWs. People who play instruments make DAWs. So when a person who knows how to play guitar or piano makes a DAW, they're not trying to make it easier for themselves to play piano. It's, a, it's a not even an afterthought. Like someone has to be in a board meeting saying, hey, why don't we add different, you know, like Ableton almost didn't add a groove pool. That's how out of that culture they are. Like groove pool was an accident. It's the best thing that they have. It's better than any other groove pool on the market, but that was accidental. Think about that. It's ridiculous. But anyway, that's how I learned all the dogs too. It's been a wild journey. Lit. What's going on, Doc? Imagine if the people invented G guitar, planet, guitar sounds. So everyone uses a guitar sampling. And break. Yeah. And everyone who picks up an instrument plays their favorite song on top of that. Like you learn by playing someone else's song. The, the argument's dumb, bro. Like people don't think all the way through it. 
they just, they think enough to be right. They don't think enough to be true. It's a, very, a really different thing. Sampling, bro, you got to be careful with that. You don't, though. You got to be good or be good at it. Alexa, clear the Juice World sample. Hey, they just add your name to the list. I, and I think it's so bad that they're going to get away from asking you. They're just going to clear it. They're going to do it. Trust me. Sure has got me green apples. Yeah. Most of the classical stuff is overlooked because of the age and it's in public domain. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. I guess ultimately it's much ado about nothing. Is using two dollars bad? I use Reason Light to create this, that, and then I flex them in a different program in Reason 10. So run with what you got. Bah, bah, bah. The multiple dog question is an interesting question. Because the multiple dog question, I always answer like people pay for it. You guys have to understand that. I answer all the questions based on me considering the fact that someone bought it. Why does this matter? Because I remember not having money to buy them. So. I. I know the price of all these things, and, and that's why it's weird to me. Like what, Reasons 300 to 400, Ableton 600 to 800, Studio One's 400 to 600, Cubase is 600 to 800. Pro Tools can be up there, if not higher. Some of them are going to subscription models. Splice is giving it up to Studio One. Like, that's a lot of money. So for a lot of people who ask me questions about multiple DAWs, I go, I don't perceive that this human spent $2,000 of hard earned money and actually have this question. And here's my pathology to that. You don't spend $2,000 on something you're not certain about. You don't spend all that money on something you know you want to use for a solution to a problem. So what happens is I get a lot of questions about a lot of DAWs, about a lot of VSTs, to a whole bunch of people who aren't solving any problems. So I can't answer the question in their domain. I don't care how they do it or how they get it and what they do, but I don't think in that domain of you have access to everything and you're trying to make multiple things work because your motivations and your tolerance is going to be different. Because if you can just download it, right, torrent it, whatever, and then get rid of it, you're not going to spend that extra time to get over the learning curve. If you can just grab it because it's out, because it's new, because it's updated, and you're not spending enough time or history with it, finishing things, what does it matter what you can do in it? You're just going to jump to the next program. In six months, it's going to have the update that does that thing, which has been the trend lately. So I don't get caught up in people who are caught up in keeping up with the dollar wars race from, from a pure perspective of lacking mastery in general. So my answer to the question about multiple DAWs is, have you mastered solving problems in any of them, right? Like, like answer that first. Have you mastered what you have? Can you create what you want and what you got? And that may look like a lot of different things. That may be a certain level for different people, may sound different. I don't care about how it sounds. I care about, can you solve problems to make stuff? If the answer to that is yes, then the only questions I answer is how to do that faster or better. So for me, could, could I sample three, four samples back in the day? Yes. How would I do that? By using really messed up tempos and trying to use the FL step sequencer with 12 blocks instead of 16, and then having these really weird hi-hat patterns, but it sounded really adorable, adorable, and I almost created a subgenre trying to figure it out because we didn't have time divisions. But why did I switch and solve that problem with Ableton? Because I didn't want to do it like that no more, and I didn't like that shuffle. So now I forced it into 4-4, four, four, and again, almost creating a new style of beat because those samples weren't meant to be to, weren't created to be heard that way. So the uh, the fetish for Ableton was more about the sampling still, <laughs> but it was about hearing things in a new way because we already heard our samples in two and four bar chops. We've already been doing that for years up until Ableton. So when Ableton comes, at least for me, I can hear it in a new way now. I get to access all these samples I skipped over because they're just fucked up in time. I'm solving a very specific problem. I haven't even addressed Ableton's workflow yet. So a lot of people can't afford that. A lot of people don't have that luxury. A lot of people are just stuck in the doll they're in. So when I revisited Reason, that's me acknowledging the fact that people invested three or $400 
That's a reason. Maybe they got the reason balance. Maybe they got a nectar controller and they got comfortable. And I'm just shining light on that platform to say to reason users that reason is still cool. Even if reason is missing this thing, this thing, this thing to solve these problems that I have, that doesn't mean you can't get busy with reason. Same thing with Ableton. I didn't want to talk about any other controller like a remember because I had machine for a lot a long time. So I was getting questions in that moment. What do you think of push? What do you think of push? What do you think of push? I was doing Ableton Live 9 videos. Push, 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 push. I bought a push. I caved in. I caved into that, not because I needed a push, but because I didn't want to talk about it without experiencing it. And because I had experience with machine and SPs, I was able to experience push and go, oh, that's fucking nifty. But do I need it to solve my problems? No, I didn't have any of those problems that push solved. So you don't see me using it as much. And that's just using me as an example. To someone else, that might be the holy grail. Like, oh, I can launch my scenes. I can do this. I can switch it. Like if you love EQ8 and the compressors and stuff, you can see them on screen. But if I put in waves, whatever in there, all I see is like null and void macros. It doesn't look as sexy as the curve on the EQ8. So if I'm not an EQ8 or default Ableton preset plugin user, all those features that are connected to the aesthetic of it are divorced because of how I solve problems. You get it? So that's not that's not saying that that's bad. That just says there's no problems for it to solve for me. So I shine light on that to be able to answer questions about Ableton Push. And you notice when I answer those questions, it's always if you like their plugins, if you arrange, if you do performance, if you do lo-fi, if you think you're adding hardware to your problem solving toolkit, Ableton would be the best one to do that. The only thing that Ableton <laughs> that I love, like love, love, and I didn't even expect to love it, um, was this vertical view and capture mode. Like I know Fruity Loops has it hidden somewhere. I think Studio One has it hidden somewhere, but with Ableton, they put it in your toolbar right next to the record button. So you're fucking around with these drum patterns or chord progressions that I always forget when I hit the record button and it's already there. That That's a frictionless workflow. You never have to hit record even, but it's frictionless. And then you drag it in and you get this idea that sounded dope when you're when you're in tune with it and it's and it, and it, and it, and it reminded you like it's like yo i got you it's right there i wasn't it wasn't the capture mode technology that was dope it wasn't the fact that it could do it, it was dope it was that how seamless that was like oh, i can just fuck around and i got shit that's dope about ableton but if you don't work that way if you do it like i do in studio one load a snare record the snare load a kick record the kick load a sample record the sample load a, a base. It's called a linear workflow. If you work linearly, which is the fastest way that I work, I don't need Ableton because Ableton actually slows me down. Um, I can compare it to Fruity Loops. Fruity Loops, another one. I got one Akai Fire <laughs> and that's what, I got two of them now, but I, I bought one, right? I bought one because everyone was shitting on it. And I know I'm so cool that I could find something dope about it. And I found all the dope things about it and did Machine Master videos on the Machine Master channel. And I said, this would be dope for the beginner who just got FL Studio and never had a controller before. This is your entry to it because you're gonna learn how to use a step sequencer, which is synonymous with all the Dave Smith instruments, the TR re-releases, the uh, Octatrax and shit like that. All that's gonna be the same. So you're gonna get the experience of that kind of thing for less than $200. Then you're gonna get the tactile control of it where you can program your drums if you use drum rack and FPC, right? I don't use FPC, so I don't need that. Also, you get the built-in, uh, that thing that Lin Drum created, the Linstrument. You get like this fake Linstrument vibe about it when you confine it to scale. And how many music theory questions do I get? That solves that problem. You lock it to a scale, you figure out your melodies in a different way that's a little bit more natural than playing a piano for a person who's never played a piano. That way is definitely much easier because you can't hit the wrong note. So it's beautiful for all those reasons. But if you've been following MG of the Future before that re revelation, you knew I had a push too. Push two solved those problems too. Before that, I have Easy Keys. Easy Keys solves that problem too. Scalar solves that problem too. Studio One can solve that problem in the way that I use it. So the Akai Fire in itself didn't solve problems for me. So I use it in FL Studio. That's it. That's the only thing it works for. But I'm in Studio One right now. So what does that say? There's still something about FL Studio that doesn't solve problems as fast as something else does, right? So what are those limitations? Melodyne. Why are we talking about Melodyne? Because it's sampling. 
Sampling in FL Studio is fun with Serato and Edison, but it's not fast. It's not faster than this. It's not as fast as, <laughs> oh, oh God. And then some people don't care about that. I do. You do when, you're, when, when your time on earth is getting closer to the other side. So um, I, I only can answer questions like that because I understand where y'all are coming from. But the root answer to all of it is gravitate towards what solves the most of your problems. Meh. I'm reading the comments. My workflow sped up 10 times when I realized the only thing that mattered was the end result. That was probably the most profound. That's the easiest way of saying what I was trying to say. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Scale of one point six is out. Be on the lookout. A. Hey. Pay for Pro Tools for class. Haven't used it again. Right. It's a is a tool. It's an end to a mean. Push is better as a playable instrument. I don't know about that. It's just, it's just the arrangement of the. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a how p humans respond. How your left and right eye talk to your brain. It just depends on how you work. Currently use Reason 10.2 and Studio One current version. Move to Studio One from Pro Tools back in the day when they had the M Audio version, right? If you sample, as long as you get into Serato sample, the DAW don't matter. Until you don't. I'll just answer it from my perspective. If I'm in Fruity Loops, and I'm chopping up samples with Serato, as I've done. Um, the chopping and recording the chops is the easiest part. Adjust, adjusting the attack, release, and the filter is very efficient to rely on just Serato for that and not a whole bunch of plugins and waiting for things to load. Like those little micro transactions you have, waiting for plugins to load or freeze your system, really distract you. Um, I like frictionless workspaces. Fruit Loops doesn't have a frictionless workspace, but that's not the same thing as saying it's a bad workspace. So Serato being self-contained does make chopping up a sample really fast. Then you add drums to it. And then if you're lucky, Serato sample gave you the right key. And then you load up your bass sound and you hit that key and they match. But if you've watched my videos, you've noticed most of the time they don't match. And it's not because Serato sample is wrong. It's because the samples I'm using are exotic. My samples are not major and or minor. They're the other scales. So only thing Serato can do is detect the major or minor version of that scale. Like if you ever look at the different modes and stuff, you'll notice like one of the chords are flatted in this mode and Liddy and one of these are raised. Well, if that happens to a root note where my bass is on the chop and not the whole tone of the song, then I'm hitting E, that chop might be D sharp or D. Intuitively, you, you ear it out and you end up figuring it out, which I've done in most videos. But that figuring it out process, after you've read what it was and it's wrong or it's not 100% yet or it's not including these different variables of the whole song is this, but the section you like to chop isn't. Once you throw all those variables into the mix, you start disconnecting from that experience. Like, oh, every sample that I like, every part of the song that I like is never the key of the fucking song. <laughs> Right, because we use the bridges, we gravitate to the outro. Me, I, I chop the middle, beginning, and end, and you know they're all written in a traditional arrangement in different keys or different transitions. So, um, I have a lot of trouble with that. As a result, finding a steady baseline that works, I can't just hold a single note of the root because it's not the root in those instances. So, Fruity Loops or Serato in any doll doesn't actually help me. What I need to do actually is chop it up in Serato. Bounce it to an audio clip, two reasons. If you move that folder where that sample is, Serato's gonna forget it. Serato ain't gonna help you find it. So converting your chops to audio keeps it preserved within your DAW workspace. So that's pro tip number one, efficiency. Two, I then convert that or record that into Melodyne. In Fruity Loops, I had to record it into Melodyne. And that's not a frictionless, frictionless because once you get it into the Melodyne editor, you gotta export it, save it somewhere, import it, convert it to a score file, five extra steps. Or take my chops here, 
Command B. Come on, hard drive, warm up. Press Command B. Yo, give me my Control Studio one. And then Command M. Two steps, right? Command B, Command M. That's my baseline. There's nothing faster than that. You, you copy that? I chopped in the Serato. Command B, Command M. That's my baseline. Can Freddy Loops do that in the current iteration? No. Can Ableton Live do that in its current iteration? Kind of. It has a similar output built into its own self, which is why it's a little bit more expensive. But you can't do this in Ableton. You can't move that key to a different place or to a different uh, pitch and then play the audio back. So it's half a Melodyne. So why would I get half a Melodyne if I already own full Melodyne? And why would I record it into it if I can just command M here? You guys understand what the problem is? See, I don't need Melodyne for hacking. I need Melodyne for those two clicks or Studio One with Melodyne for those two clicks. That's all I need it for. I ain't talking about stealing no one's intellectual property yet. I ain't talking about flipping samples yet. I ain't talking about interpolating yet. I ain't talking about none of that. I'm just talking about the two steps it takes for me to get a baseline. That's a really big problem for me to solve. To other maestros and virtuosos, it might not be. So this might not be the perfect doll for them. And I understand that. Do you think it's good to always have an upgrade mentality? Like moving from reason to hardware stuff? I think hip hop breeds competition. And I think competition will, will put a, a script in your mind to want to invest in yourself. <laughs> and in investing in yourself, what happens with humans is, remember how I was telling you like everyone wants to make square music? Well, once that becomes easy for a certain mass, people aren't going to make square music no more. And we thought trap was going to die because more and more people make trap. But what trap did was it added a triangle at the top. So trap's now a house. <laughs> so people are trying to figure out how to build a house now. So the same thing with the human condition of doing that, adding to the shapes and making more complex shapes, uh, you add complexity to your life when you become efficient. And that's why it's important to become efficient, right? Like follow me. I just showed you how easy it is for me to chop samples for Serato, convert it to audio, convert it to melody, add a bass line. The only thing left is layering it with a drum break, and I'm technically made everything in the 90s. You know, fix the grooves and quantize things and get things in pocket and layer things, but you're just reusing data when different sounds are mixing, right? That's a four-step process to make anything I want in that realm. That's efficient, that's quick, and that's at the mercy of my sound selection in my ear. But the, but the operation to do it was for different things. So now I'm super efficient at that if I cared. But the thing is about becoming comfortable and becoming easy or lazy or efficient at knowing this, because it took 10 years before that was available to me, I don't want to do that no more. That's the hilarious thing about it. Once I created that square, I don't want to make it no more. I don't want to make classic hip hop no more for a lot of reasons. One, who cares? Two, it took too long for me to get to this point. Three, that's not what we're doing anymore. And four, now that it's easy, just the human condition of me figuring it out and going, oh, I figured it out. No one cares. I, I waited too long. The technology came too late or the samples weren't available till now or I didn't know or now I know, you know, all this shit. So when I do my YouTube channel, I'm speeding that up for everybody else. So if there's something that I'm showing you that you need to figure out to build the house that we're currently living in, you can do it sooner than I did. And then that way you can manipulate and be part of the marketplace. Be good at it. Trade. But with that being said, that's why you see me on Twitter talking about NPC Live. I'm only talking about the NPC Live because of the challenge part of it, right? There's a new challenge with that. This doesn't challenge me. I'll show you in a minute. Anyone think Keyscape is worth the price or can I find contact libraries that sounds good? Keyscape is worth the price because of the volume. The question is, do you need 2,000 pianos or two? Any thoughts on the new Cubase 10 and 64-bit float system? Also, do you master finish a full song in Studio One? No, I don't master. Y'all lucky if y'all catch me mixing. That's that's an old, that's a, huh. Let me share a cool story. So, 
Someone retweeted on my timeline. So this is what I find funny about YouTube. Some people will comment about Nick Mirror's situation, but those same people will be on Twitter, be the first one comments in a Nick Mirror tweet. So because this person follows me, when they liked a Nick Mirror tweet, I saw their name and then I clicked on it and then I saw what they said to Nick Mirror. And Nick Mirror was saying he was uh, sharing free loops or something. And I guess everyone signs up for free loops, why not? But in the comments, on top of him saying, yo, today I'm going to do this, I'm going to give you free loops, and I'm going to make another video today, a cook-up video. All his comments were, for requests, were for mixing and mastering. And I found that impec I found that interesting, that the people following Nick Mirror or those producers that look up to him, they don't have a problem with 808s and pitch glides. They don't have a problem with wave supply MIDI. They don't have a problem with sampling, even, if they want to. They don't have a problem with Omnisphere or downloading, whatever. They have a problem with putting all that together and making it sound good, right? And that's, and that's why I think purists need to relax because although this technology does so much, everyone hits the same fork in the road. How do you get it to sound good? I know what Easy Keys does fundamentally, but how do I make it sound interesting? I know what Chord Track does fundamentally, but what do I change it to to make it my own? Oh, I know what all this does and I know the baseline comes out of the audio, but what sample do I use to get a good baseline? You still have these tertiary things that only come from time and skill. You know what I mean? Everyone can draw squares, but can you draw it perfect? Can you draw 90 degree angles freehand? Not many people can do that. So that, that's why there's no there's no scarcity because everyone's skill length the same. Everyone's awareness and exposure is the same, but their skills aren't the same. So to answer your question about this, the Cubase 10 and the mixing engine and do I mix and master in Studio One, why that all applies is because these kids don't have a mixing and mastering problem. I know that. You don't have a mixing and mastering problem. You have an idea problem. Because if you had good ideas, you would not need to be mixing and mastering. And I mean that in a in a focus way. I don't mean there's no need for mixing and mastering. I mean, in a, you don't need to focus on mixing and mastering if the idea is good. Because if you're making good ideas, people want them. And if people want them, they're going to mix and master for you. It's a logical jump. If you make a really good solid hip hop beat or trap beat, and let's say you didn't side chain or some bullshit, but the rapper fucks with it, and then the rapper takes it to the studio and the engineer that you're about to stress out, he fixes it. He mixes it. But you made the beat and sold it already. It's out of your hands, chief. You, I, I much rather be on, on that scale because your famous producers that everyone's trying to be with this mixing and mastering are doing that. They're not mixing and mastering all their beats. They're, they're not finalizing anything. It's a factory, guys. They get an efficient four-step workflow to make what they make, what they're known for, and they send it to someone's engineer or their own. So the only benefit you have to worrying your precious little minds about mixing and mastering is if you're releasing and mixing artists of your own. And if you're recording as an artist self or you're recording with other artists collaborations, I need you to stop wearing so many hats because you're never gonna get shit done. If you want to mix and master as a mix engineer, you've stumbled across my channel and you want my perspective on it as a beat maker or producer, I understand that. But if you're a beat maker or producer and that's all you're doing, what are we talking about? Neutron automatically EQs and compresses. You can take those EQ settings and put in any of your favorite EQs. You can take those compression settings and put them into any of your favorite compressor settings. If it's a compressor, adjust the threshold and ratio. If it's an EQ, change how sharp or steep the curves and filters are. Every other cool effect that we have is for effect. You put that before or after this automated system occurs. You can adjust the stereo width now that Isotope gave us relay. You can compare these things and see the masking and frequencies. But if you're picking good sounds to begin with, you're not using a whole bunch of sounds that would mask each other anyway, because you're using less sounds because you're more efficient in creating. And bass is bass frequency. Melody is melody frequency. Drums are in the middle. What are we talking about? There's no voice yet. So you really don't need half the plugins that come out because you're not dealing with the complexities of voice over strings and pianos or pads for the most part. So once you get that situated, you know the bass is loud, you know the hi-hats are louder, you upload it to Emaster, Lander, whoever wants to do a new service, and you let it finish and you send it to SoundCloud and you're done. Why do I keep preaching that? I keep preaching that because people use that shit of not knowing how to mix and master as an excuse for making good music. They're using the excuse of not knowing how to mix and master as an excuse for releasing the good music that they have already. They're using that shit of knowing how to mix and master to think that that's why they're not selling beats or not. The best producers that y'all think are good, like AP Cash, Money, Cody, and all of them, I don't think they can mix at all. I don't like none of their mixes. 
Doesn't matter what I think though. Caveat, sidebar. Doesn't matter if I like their mixes. They're not better mixers than Johnny Giuliano. But they're probably selling more beats right now. So what does that mean? Johnny Giuliano's focus is different. His aims are different. These kids' focus are different. Their aims are different. They're charted. They're visible. They're aware. They're the new thing. Mixing and mastering is not their priority. Staying in that position is their priority. It has nothing to do with mixing and mastering. Most of these kids give and sell templates for their mixes. What are we talking about, family? What the hell are we worried about? What are y'all talking? What do y'all want to mix and master for? Help me out. I, I see no benefit to the beat maker in the climate that we're in. I get the I get the uh, I get the higher side chats of this shit. I get which I get the purest part of it. Trust me, because I started there. I'm breaking myself now. I'm breaking myself off of that pedestal. Because that's how I got Pro Tools and all that. That's how I got a UAD card I don't use. That's how I bought $3,000 worth of plugins I don't touch. That's how I got into all that. And I am telling you, fuck it. <laughs> so, <laughs> not because they're not utility. They're not solving a problem that I have anymore. So, you got to ask yourself, is that really a problem you need to solve? Bars. Da, 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 da. Melodic Mouse said... NPC live on the way. Yeah, you're doing your own artist. <laughs> yeah, the better, the more skillful you get, the less you mix anyway. That's why, I, like I use my influences, the Neptunes. I didn't think Neptunes had the best melodies. I think Neptunes had the best arrangements. Like. The Neptunes were the clearest and easiest to understand of what they were doing. You clearly hear the drums. You clearly hear the quantize or lack of. You clearly hear bass. You clearly hear the guitar. And you clearly hear the Waldorf lead. Like everything is so staged perfectly. And you would think that's a mixing trick. But when you really write that on paper, there's five elements. How do you not mix that? They're all in a different octave. Come on now. Bars. Do that. Re repeat that in the genre you're making. And if it's not strong enough when you do that, what are you missing? Are you missing the idea? Or are you missing 20 different synths you need to layer? I doubt it's that. What's good, Sky? Full arrangements don't need a lot of mixing today. I don't even think beats need mixing with the way sounds and VSC sound today. You end up hurting your mix more than you help it. Relax. I think that's all I got, guys. The last thing I want to show you for the people who thugged it out with me until this point. I'm sorry, guys. My ears hurt. Like, I had that really loud uh, ringing in my ear, and it didn't stop until about an hour ago. Now my ear, like, literally hurts. But um, this song. So I did this on my uh, Isotope uh, Nectar 3 review or whatever. I don't even know if people paid attention to what this beat was. So what stirred the controversy with Juice World was the fact that he kept his sample on top of these layers. And the question people were asking is, would it have been different if he removed the original audio layer? Uh, fundamentally, yes, because he wouldn't be paying for master clearance of the recording. But Sting would still flex on the writer's part of it. But that percent could look different. The negotiation would be different. Um, but what I'm amazed by is why they didn't do this instead. I'm just going to show you something. And this answers some of those questions about you need to get back to other DAWs. Let's just focus on this part. No, that's the wrong one. I just want the four chords. So there's seven chords here. You know, a part A and a part B type thing. I just want to focus on this part, the drop. That's the most recognizable part of Sting's performance. And what I have done simply was this two steps I described. I took Sting's sample and I made a perfect loop and perfect tempo and matched my project to that tempo first before I changed anything. 
I bounced it, I melodyned it, and I got a really ugly MIDI clip because it had all kinds of other shapes in there that wasn't the chord. I then jumped into a new MIDI track and I used the beauty and power of what we call ghost channels where we can see MIDI behind MIDI, which is one of the reasons why I stayed on Fruity Loop so long because no other DAW had it until I started doing discussions about it. Stay woke. Now that all the DAWs almost have it, we, we can get funkier and reason and able to now. But before I brought that to everyone's attention, Fruity Loops would be the only program you can do that in. But in Studio One, you can do that and you can snap it to scale. And what's different about snapping to scale than seeing the scale behind you is that you don't have to do this consciously. It's less friction. So if I click this note and scale snap is on, I can figure out what chord or passing note they meant to pick just by going up and down one or two steps. And those one or two steps is usually right because you're skipping the bad notes. So that's just a pro tip from how, how I think and how I work with it and why I work with it. So once I trace these and I move these to the right snap and try to mirror the chord I saw behind me, if it sounded funny, I completed it just by duplicating that note and bringing it to where it should be in the chord. It, it becomes really second nature to you. So once you have that, all you start doing now is like turn your snap off and start nudging notes so they sound like strums. That's the only thing that Studio One really needs is these uh, multipliers or qualifiers that FL Studio uses. But as it is, I did that manually, it ain't rocket science, because you can still see it behind you. It, it's time consuming, but for two or four chords, it's, it's that 10 minutes you would have picked um, up struggling with a sample you didn't like, right? Or trying to play it by ear or whatever, whatever, right? So you're done with that. Now that I have that, I can use chord track. Now this chord track is based on the audio sample. And I just copy and pasted it so my baseline finds it. But that is not the chord track that I have. And I didn't realize that until I reopened this project to, to do this discussion. So I'm gonna re so just remember what these are. You can pause the video and rewind it. I'm gonna remove these because those were based on audio. The new one I'm gonna create is gonna be based on MIDI. So extract a chord track. A totally different set of characters, I think. Unless I'm bugging here. Yeah. So it's not E6 anymore, C sharp, it's B minor, and then it's B suspended, whatever. Don't know, don't care. So now that I've created a new chord progression, technically, because I traced it and filled in the blanks and got these new variables, that's no longer sting shit anymore. They would have to Marvin Gaye lawsuit me at this point. Then, genius. You could just highlight all these keys and move it to a different key, make it even weirder to detect or for it to be an issue. And then they go, but you kind of took the melody line, snap the damn MIDI and move the melody line to a different key that works, right? Like this is just common sense stuff like I'm thinking in my mind. There's a hundred ways to flip this. But because it's Studio One, the easiest way to flip this It's just to go into your circle of fifths and go some damn where else. Let me, uh, let me not flex. I didn't even change it. <clears throat> Select your track, follow chords, parallel. You see how those changed over there? That's bad news because those chords are wrong. The chord track is wrong. I'll fix that another day. But just here, none of these changed. My main four didn't change because this is based on the actual MIDI I'm using. So, parallel, now I can click on these and just go to, I change the melody. So let's keep going. Whoa. So that's D sharp. The flow of this was around F sharp minor before. So he went from F sharp down or counterclockwise to C for the next chord. So D sharp counterclockwise is going to be E. And then he went back one. So the next one would be G. And then this B sus suspended one, he goes out of key, right? But he doesn't go far out of F sharp minor. He goes to G sharp minor, which is a neighbor. But the B is over C sharp, which is in this scale. So the, the, the key that is, damn it, you. 
So the key that is touching it becomes the root note or over C sharp. It's funky stuff. But I could find the same thing up here. Where's the G sharp? What else can you touch? Pause. Out of key. And then bring it back to D sharp sustained. Maybe D minor. Maybe I'll sauce it like that. And that under key got to change. I can just make it D again, right? Or D sharp. Whatevs. This ain't the same thing as uh, transposing it and keeping the melody intact because I changed the gender of the chords. I went from minors to majors. That's a whole different song now. So I got to make it sound better than that. That's trash. Hold up. <laughs> Let me get this right for Easter. Major 7. And that last one ain't working. That could work. There we go. And then put it over the root, under the root of that. So now I have the essence. I have the, what basically what Easy Keys tries to do. And the reason why you could do it in this is because instead of me using the Easy Keys performances, I'm tra I trace the performance. And then use this to change the chords that belong to that performance. So now it's not the same song anymore. And if I really wanted to, I'd fix this because I can see it from bird's eye view and I'll look at this G sharp in the circle of fifths and I'll start, man, don't get me started. I'll wait for something to change, bro. Maybe it's a minor. Yeah. What the hell, what the, what the hell are they going to tell me? Nothing. And then he went from that guitar patch, which was a dummy mission. He would have, you know how many sounds we have in this world? Celestas, bells, harps, piano, roads. You know, and you change the duration of the notes to be instrument appropriate. Those kids are already half timing everything. And then what you'd have to do, because I layered this, these all have to follow too. those are wrong. What the fuck are we talking about? So who, whose beat is it now? Like the bro said earlier in my comments, you know, I mute it and then, you know, it's mine. Is this mine now? Does this legally qualify as mine? That's what I'm saying. It's such the inspiration in the copyright debate is so transient. It's about what you can prove. It's not based in reality. And now it sounds like a house chord, yeah. It's happy now.
So do people understand why I use Studio One now? I'm not solving any other problem but that one. Look how fast that is. Like, I stumbled around because it's not from scratch. When I do it from scratch, it's way more seamless because I'm only focusing on one layer at a time. But theoretically, you know, you speed that shit up, man, whatever. You change the tempo, like, it's MIDI now. It's not even the same shit, like. You know people can't detect nothing when you change the speed half the time, right? Like the most common ear. Not thinking about Sting. But these are the kids selling MIDI packs and they don't know that. Whatever. I, I just, just, just think me later, Nick. For, for, for next time, for the next track. Just, I wanna help you out. So if you start seeing all your, your favorite creators in Studio One suddenly, know what it's about. So, but, but I, that's a weird flex, okay? All I'm saying is, we're in a different time, man. And even this cool trick, man, there's about 10 people out there ringing my ear on this side saying, man, I've been new to that. Why am I sharing all the sauce? Oh man, there's a faster way to do that, but I ain't never going to teach no one how to do it. You know, there's always that. But I share it because I, I, I share this approval point. <laughs> if that kid made that beat, if he sampled that beat and made it in, in 20 minutes, I would have flipped it and made it my own in 10. So the, the, the next part is this version of the beat, does it have the same impact as Sting's version of the beat? No. The Sting guitar and the Sting progression is powerful because it's in our collective consciousness from all these different sources. So them keeping the sample in there and keeping the integrity of the file in there is an intentional ploy and play on people's connection to the original record. And that's what makes hit songs. And anyone who listens to anything released by Atlantic Records knows that. So it doesn't matter how much dark magic I have. If I'm not capturing the magic of something, whether it's from the drums and the bass or the magic of something from a genre, this ain't ever going to be a hit. It's going to be mine. And I don't even know how I feel about that. But it's never going to be a hit because hits come from hits. But could he have avoided Sting by doing this? Yes. Could there have been a different song by Juice World that wasn't 5 million copies sold? Yes. You see, you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> Y'all silly. <laughs> but that's all I wanted to talk about. I'm just shooting the breeze, fellas. I, I don't I don't perceive I don't perceive that we can maintain these old ideas and arguments with with this with what I just did, what I just showed you. Because it th this this program's so foolish, bro. It it does it the audio. Like you can follow chords on audio even. Like not for nothing, he could have like he could have quantized the audio of the sample. Like, let me try that. No, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a copyright takedown at the end of my damn live stream. Um, no, 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 I'm not. Because I'm gonna play it after the fact. Can I do? No, I can just unmute it. I disabled this track. All right, so that's what the Melodyne built in, right? You got click out, click in, do the hokey pokey, turn yourself around, and it comes back. So that's that, right? But what if I didn't want to do that? What if I was flexing for the live stream and like I conveniently hit this window? Well, all I would have to do is do follow chords parallel and then on tuning mode, set it to guitar. What are we talking about? But I don't know how this is going to sound. I need to solo just one thing at a time for a moment. Bro, come on now. Come on, man. Nah, they're 
gonna get me for that, bro. Oh, uh, give me a filter. This is ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous that I can't use this for educational purposes without Sting taking 100%. Who, that, who I sound like. I have to sauce my video to use this. That's that bullshit. I ain't selling 5 million anything. I don't sound like you're following any chords, bro. Maybe you are. Maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, it's not doing it. I'm gonna use a new track. Command B. And so the audio track. Bro, I'm in a matrix. What are the I don't even realize what I'm looking at sometimes. I've never had to do that before. Anyway, okay. down you're not following the chords my friend it just wants me to demonetize my video it'll work any other time i just done this the other day it's trying to get me caught out there fellas i can't do it yeah you can change it like it's playing with me there it is it changed stop that I'm picking the right gender of the chord I think I have to make that a major you, you can figure that out with audio basically if I had a clean session I had that audio clip by itself and I focused on what the actual chords were which studio one geniusly tells you what they should be at the bottom and then you match that to the top and then you start changing them from there and you pick the right gender of chords but you just change what the key is that audio then isn't the original master recording so is this new strum I created that I could load into sample one Sting's guitar anymore. On what level is it his guitar? Because I changed his major chord to a minor chord. He didn't play a minor chord. So so you see what I'm saying? How, how this gets really messy really fast? What are you talking about, bro? Yeah, the familiar, familiarity of the song is largely part and parcel to why people gave it a chance. Now, what it did after people gave it a chance and resonated with it is a totally different thing. That's where the five million comes from. This ain't no, this ain't no nice way of doing sample stuff. This is uh, being good at it. Yeah, there's a few other dolls that are trying to do this. There's even iPad apps that do that. Open a cleaning company. You're a silly.
is what Timberland used to do, right? So most of us don't have the VSCs for like a, a dope guitar like that. So I took st one of Sting's chords. I, f I changed the gender of his chord. And then I'm half-timing it and pitching it and filtering it, right? Is that Sting's guitar anymore? Y'all tell me. Yeah, it's kind of hot. It'd be hotter if I put the drums in the context with those chops. But it's already kind of hot because that sample that I got it from is already kind of hot. That doesn't sound like that with the sample tank version of that guitar. That sounds like that because it was Sting's something. It, was, it used to be Sting's. But that stands alone. That's why hip-hop has to sample. We can't get away of why we can't qualify why we can't do that with Nexus. We can't qualify why we can't do that with Omnisphere. It's only because it's that guitar. I promise you that. I will show you. Because it's not that way. It's not, they, these are not all created equal. Not even changing. It sounds cheaper because of the, the, the fidelity of the VST. It's all right. This one's way better. The way things happen, bros. We can't get rid of samples. Hey, <laughs> y'all funny. But uh, yeah, man. I guess in, in closing, all I'm saying is be good or be good at it. Like you really gotta understand what I mean by that. Like. I be fucking around on YouTube <laughs> because YouTube won't YouTube won't monetize you with the things I would do. Like I have a whole catalog of beats now of stuff I don't like. And, and we'll, let me contextualize that. I force myself to work. I, I, I force myself into certain challenges and problems for the sake of doing a YouTube video. Because what I really want to pass on to people is how I go about solving problems. I already told y'all though, it takes me 10 minutes to make real beats like that. You know what I mean? Like if I didn't set up these goofy little challenges and ways to provoke myself to be effective for others, I'd, I'm already effective for myself. Do that in 10 minutes, the whole process and be done with it. And then, like I said, send it to Emastered and put it in my story and be like, yo, I'm productive. I'm working. Leave me alone there. You know, f do some weird flexes if I wanted to. But I think, I think I, in, in this moment, because that is overlooked, because I'm 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 kind of uh, in the shadows when it comes with that, I think my utility to humanity or to my community, to my tribe, to my people and my sphere of influence, you know, my my tribe over here, I think if I can get all of us on that level or able to see that and approach that and create that way, I, I'll end up solving a bigger problem. And that problem is, why does everything sound the same? Although I'm teaching you how to be good at it, you're going to find a million different things to inspire you to do these things that then give birth to new stuff. Because it's new technology, and a lot of people aren't using it. The people winning are using it, but there's like three people winning. So we're going to change the landscape of music with this shit. Two, um, the people who feel like they didn't have a chance before, because they see these perceivable skill gaps 
and they're reading the comments of purists and they think that's reality or it's intangible. It's, it's very tangible and it'll take you an hour to watch a video in 10 minutes a day until you can do it in five minutes a day. And then on, on top of all of that, <laughs> in a very weird cloud atlas type of way, the more I help others see it, the more I see it myself. You know, I'm not teaching y'all, I'm teaching me. Although I know it already, like, like I teach myself greater lessons from doing this shit. I, get, I have a lot of fun answering questions. I have a lot of fun showing people stuff. And that's why I get so passionate and pissed off because people just don't be listening to me sometimes. Because because I'm not trying to be right. You know, I, How do I say it? Like cer certain conversations, there's right and wrong. In this society, everyone wants to be right. And then in the middle, it's wrong. This is how both of you are wrong. Like everyone tries to be very super liberal about shit. I, I don't care about that and when it comes to this. I spent too much time doing this to be be sitting there trying to be diplomatic or democratic about it. It is what it is, folks. You can see it, you cannot see it. But don't sit here and tell me it's, it's sugar when it's shit. Don't pee on my head and tell me it's rain. You feel me? Like, this is lit. Like, this this is the pinnacle of 20 to 30 years of type of production you can do in a few clicks, if you so choose. If you so feed it the right inspiration. If you so choose to be inclined to get on Splice or whoever and get these samples. If you so choose to convert a few YouTubes to audio. If you so choose to participate in these things, you can create some phenomenal work with just some basic understanding of arrangement, which is why I did those videos. A little bit of mixing, because you don't want to be willy-nilly with this stuff. You do want to filter. And I tell you, most of the mixing I do is filtering and limiting. I use L2 and a generic, now Relay. So so because Relay came out, Relay's my filter and Stereo Imager, all built in one. And if it had a limiter on it, come on, Isotope. If it was built in limiter on its channel thing, I don't think there is. But if there was, that'd be the only plugin I used to mix. Uh, in terms of balancing character and color and all that stuff comes later if at all but then you man come on I feel like uh, Boosie come on man come on dog this is it it's so so what I'm saying is if I get everyone to that level things change if I get a lot of people to that level things change the charts look different what we hear is different the conversations we're gonna have is different the people I inspire. So, because I, I, what I'm really interested in seeing is how dope, how the how fucking dope is the next MG the future going to be? Like that's mind boggling to me. That's scary to me. Like once once people catch on and realize what I've been doing this whole time in the past and like in past sense, there's some other kids who benefited from that somehow or another. You know, the hundred monkey experiment. People will start to figure it out and do this regularly, and then there'll be another person who felt like me who emerges and teaches like this whatever like I'm, I'm trying to make it cool to share this stuff i'm trying to make it cool to give the real tips and not the this is the dumb shit i be seeing man hard work and persistence the fuck are y'all talking about like oh my god what does that even mean people just be saying like like weird stuff but they don't show you nothing they, they'll say some really weird catchy stuff but don't don't demonstrate it and then they say some weird stuff and then make some whack beats and fall off and be like so hard work and persistence have a dead end fuck out of here like let me calm down. I'm out of here, guys. Yo, I love y'all, man. <laughs> but anyway, be good or be good at it. Until next time, guys.